All right, so welcome back to ECS 277 on uh, Data Century Computer Architecture again. And today we are going to talk about the roofline model and its implications. Uh, but before we start, as a tradition of uh, my teaching, because I know people are going to come in uh, late sometimes, and you guys help yourself on a, on a dessert and coffee, and uh, hope. Hopefully, I won't see those croissants uh, after the class. Uh, the cookies, yeah, we can, we can, we can, we can keep it freeze and give you the next time, but not for the croissant. So they, they must, they must be away, right? And we have water today, so help yourself. Um, okay, so <clears throat> where are we? Where, where were we in the last lecture? So we were talking about right now. We are living in a world that uh, when we write a program or when we use our computer to. Uh, uh, to process our data, this is typic typically the way how we use the computer. So uh, again, uh, when, when we uh, use the computer uh, to process data or do something, it's typically that you have to launch a program on the CPU. So first of all, that's why it's a CPU-centric model. And what do we do on the CPU program? First of all, uh, we grab data. Uh, the source data is from the disk. And then um, initial, most of the time, the, the the file, if your program cannot directly digest it. So it turns out that we need to write some code that's not really contributing to our uh, computation, not really contributing to our outcome, but actually all you are doing in the very beginning, a lot of code is just doing one thing, that's making the source data become uh, the data structure that your algorithm can digest. So that's the very first thing we will do, the first two things we will do, right? And if you can map this to the hardware architecture. The initial data source is actually in disk or secondary storage, for example, right now, solid state drive. And sometimes if you have a network storage or network attached storage, that's on the disk or somewhere, uh, some memory in a, mem uh, in, in a network uh, computer, right? So that comes from the NIC, so, or some kind of secondary uh, or peripheral devices. And then we make a data structures in the main memory of your system because remember in volume architecture, everything including your data and code, they must be presented in a main memory first. So that's why the data structure has to be presented in a, a memory first. So that's the second thing we will do, make it, uh, make the data structure. And then we finally, once we have the data ready, we finally launch the algorithms on the hardware. So, um, Right now, um, uh, well, so in the very beginning, most of the time we run this on uh, processors, uh, but right now we know we have accelerators, we have GPUs, so that's why we leverage those uh, to run these algorithms. 
And then finally, we output the result. Uh, even uh, sometimes you visualize it from the display that you user, user perceivable, or sometimes we just make it storage data or data structure database in, input output. So that's the that's the software perspective of, of our computation model. But if you look at this model, right? Um, what really happened is that, well, uh, uh, we have a lot of bottleneck here. And uh, in the last lecture, we talked a few potential things that we can do. Uh, for example, we talk about, well, what if we put uh, processors near data, right? So the first question is that, okay, under what kind of situation we can use near data processing, right? And Or uh, sometimes, should I make a system with more memory bandwidth? Or should I use hardware accelerators for, for my program or my code, right? And um, in the past, when you take CS203, uh, on the final exam, all you talk is like, okay, it depends, uh, blah, 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 right? But right now, if you design a system, you want to make decisions, right? This is the class teach you how to make this design decisions and on, under what situation we should do what. So, uh, but another thing which um, is, uh, kind of uh, we, we were talking about is that, okay, so right now let's put everything. This is the modern computer we have. And surprisingly, this is also true even with embedded system or your mobile phone, is that uh, no matter what kind of programming model that you are using, uh, the hardware architecture is essentially still CPU-centric in a way that all the data paths has to go through the PCI root complex uh, because that's where the, uh, and because that's how we interconnect our peripherals. So even though you are leveraging accelerators, it's basically you have to offload stuff from your CPU to these accelerators, and the data has to come through the CPU still. So that's why uh, some people, some a lot of people would envision that, well, in the future, NVIDIA would be the dominating company in hardware uh, infrastructure. And I kind of argue that, because if you look at this picture, if we don't change the execution model, programming model, then it turns out that everything has still still has to go through uh, the CPU, right? So CPU is still the center of everything. So Intel still have a great future, right? So uh, that's why I never envision like Nvidia to be the only dominant com company in the generative AI future or whatever future, because it's unlikely the case if you look at the 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 the, the, the hardware model that we have for now. And uh, we were talking about, okay, so uh, if, if we are uh, bottlenecked by the CPU-centric model, another thing that we can make a difference is that why don't we just put processors everywhere, like processor in memory, processor in SSD, processor in uh, the network interface card. But again, under what situation is it okay to do that, right? So should we go with compute-centric model, data-centric model, um, that's a big debate all the time. And today in the lecture, we are going to talk about a few tools that can help you make these decisions. For example, which is uh, the roofline model, as the paper you read uh, this time, uh, we are talking about a different uh, way to analyze the system, bottleneck the potential of your system. And then we will talk about with that, it will justify us why we want heterogeneous computing nowadays. So uh, to begin with, uh, I always like to have like a three minute uh, open-ended question at the beginning of the class. So today the question, well, this is slightly off the topic, but actually you will know that it's kind of like related to the roofline model we are talking about. So um, how much can a boba tea shop earn each day? Three minutes. <laughs> And in the meantime, if you haven't grabbed snacks or coffee, feel free to come by this corner. And uh, I don't want to see this croissant after the class, so take it. Uh, the coffee is not good after the class, so take them all away. Uh, here are some cups, and if you just want water, we also have some. <sighs> No, 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 we'll just 
All right, businessman, what do you think? So you know, I I had this discussion with my friend. So um, so give you some background. So before coming back to California, I was working in North Carolina, uh, uh, in a city called Raleigh. Not sure how many of you heard about it. Uh, and but in, I think I worked there. I worked there between 2016 and 2019. And one thing that I don't like about about Raleigh is we don't have good like boba tea place. So so like. You know, like the, yeah, I just don't understand. So there, there was one Kung Fu tea, uh, newly opened at that time, and it takes people like around like 30 minutes to line up to get the stuff. And yeah, I know it's recorded, but okay, let me try to rephrase it. It's not, <laughs> it's not the type of boba tea that I'm looking for, <laughs> right? So, so I just don't understand that. And I was discussing with my friend, what, why can't we just have like, you know, Wushi Land to come here? And maybe, maybe, ha maybe having like some fried chicken, uh, like, like Taiwanese style, like uh, chicken fillet, right? Uh, so together, right? And how much we can earn? Because we were actually looking about like a place, like how much is the rent there? And uh, if we pay people based on uh, the basic salary and give them insurance, right? And uh, this is probably the amount of money we have to pay every day and how much money we can earn every day to pay that off and we, it turns out that hmm okay that's just sticky with our job but uh, okay so if you want to estimate how much a boba tea shop can earn every day how can you estimate that how are you going to estimate it okay average number of teas Sold per day, right? Okay, so how does the average number of teas sold per day determine? Well, how do, like, what are the factors determining how many cups of teas that you can ever, you can, you can, you can sell every day? Location, okay. <clears throat> if you have a good location, you will sell more, right? But is there a limiting factor? Like, how many you can sell every day? Number of people living around, okay, so the, the customer, right? So that's why you don't see a lot in Riverside, right? No, 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 like huge amount of population. Yeah, I heard people, <sighs> all right, what else? The weather, okay, that's a factor. What else? What? How stressed the people are? Do you drink boba tea because you are stressful? <laughs> no, I drink boba tea because I like it. Um, number of workers. Number of workers, right? Don't forget about that, right? Number of people working in a shop, right? And that determines the service rate of your or um, of your shop, right? So if you only have one people, one person working there, right? There is a maximum amount of cups that everyone can make every day, right? So 
The amount of people determines that. Uh, the rental fee, utility. utility. Okay, so that's the cost part, right? But uh, so when I say earn each day, yeah, that's part of it. But uh, I'm more about like the total revenue instead of the profit. So what? what? The 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 quality or the quantity of ingredients, right? Quality. quality. Okay, how good the teas that you can get. Production capacity. Uh, say more about that. How many can you produce every day, right? So it's like how many workers you have, right? And how many? What else? So like to add on to location, if there's more competitors, you have less sales. Mm, you have less sales, right? But what if I don't have com competitors? How much boba you have in stock? How much? How how much boba you have in the stock, right? Or say the supply of your stock, right? So those are the things, right? So uh, first of all, right? How how, how many cups we can make each day, and how many customers we can attract each day, right? And even though we are in a, in a location that with a lot of like uh, boba drinking com uh, community like uh, in Los Angeles, right? I can attract like more than a thousand customers every day. But if I am not able to make that many cups each day, I have a upper cap of our uh, revenue of each day. And also how much each cup, how, how expensive do you sell the cup? Right, if I can sell um, seven dollar per cup with a thousand cups every day, right? That's how much. Seven thousand. Seven thousand. That sounds like a small number, right? So seven thousand dollars per day, right? And then um, if you sell it like okay, even though I have like one thousand cups every day, if I'm in a place that I can only sell it for three point five, then I get three uh, thirty five hundred per day. Right, so those are the determining factors regarding how much I can earn. So uh, here's the thing: in terms of the uh, performance of your program, the maximum performance or the performance of your program, right? So let's look at that, right? How many bytes of data that we can supply each cycle, right? So it's actually like so. If you think about so, if you change the data to be your customer. And if you change the boba tea shop or your workers as your computing resource, right, then the same analogy would work, right? How many bytes of data that we can supply from the peripherals would determine the uh, data processing rate? Agree? Right? So that's a determining factor. How many customers? How many bytes of data? If you consider the data as the customer of your computer, that's an easy analogy. How many cups can we make each day? It's actually the service rate of your processor. So how many operations that we can perform each cycle would actually determine the service rate, right? So even though I have tons of bytes from the memory, from the peripherals, but if I have a slow processor, it's going to be bottleneck. Or if I have a very powerful processor, but my data supply rate sucks, then the performance is also determined or kept by the data supply rate, right? And you may ask about how much each cup cost. Uh, it's actually how many up each byte of data would need, right? So uh, it's actually like, okay, how many operations? So we have bytes, right? And sometimes if you are in an algorithm that every byte of data doesn't need a lot of computation, right? The cost is not that high. But here, what if for every byte of data, we have to do a lot of data processing, right? So the computation cost would be high. So that's the analogy of the boba tea shop, and in fact, that's the whole idea of our roofline model, believe it or not. But um, so the first thing that I would like to say, like uh, let's start with this. We talk about how many operations per byte we need, and if you have read the paper, this is essentially the operational intensity of your algorithm. So it's the number of operations each byte of data would need for running an algorithm. And as you can tell, because it's based on the algorithm, so when you change the algorithm, the operational intensity per byte would change. So let's start with the simplest, probably the one that you are very familiar with, uh, you are familiar with, is called the matrix multiplications, right? So a lot of people have nightmare with matrix multiplications after my, uh, taking my class. So saying that if today I'm writing a program, uh, and that's forget about all the optimizations that you have to apply. 
the very basic matrix multiplication algorithm, right? And if it's 32 bit floating point numbers are the ones, are the customers of us, right? How are, how, what's the operational intensity? So first of all, right, saying that I want to perform an uh, M times, times N times P matrix multiplications, meaning that uh, I have matrices uh, sized as uh, M times N, and uh, the other one is like N times P, and uh, so the result will be N M times P, right? So that's my, that's the matrix that I'm doing, right? So if I'm writing a code, then what kind of code am I going to write? Do, do you guys remember that? What? Is it what? Uh, if, forget about the tile. What's the very basic version? Loop, right? How many loop? How many levels of the loop? Three. Three levels, right? So I will have a triple level of nested loop, right? So, uh, and so if uh, sometimes you can do some optimization, right? So for example, uh, here we try to. Uh, aggregate all the results, so we create a lot of data access for the C matrices, but this is a, actually a very basic optimization. I just put a variable to store all the temporary data and aggregate it, right? So that's actually a somewhat optimized version of the matrix multiplication before you compile, and sometimes the compiler can do this. Okay, so if I have this version of code, right, and then um, how many operations in total am I going to perform when I, it, when I run these pieces of code, how many floating point operations in total? How many floating point operations in total? Two times n times n times p, right? So this is the amount of operations that we have to perform. Agree? How many bytes of data do we have to consume or access? Consider it's a 32-bit floating point. How many data memory access? Simply for the reading part. Divided by four. Are you sure? Right, here's the thing, right? So first of all, uh, if you check the code, right? So we have um, two here, right? And then, why are we plus one? Because we have one here, right? And um, um, then you have you have two inside, right? So this will be uh, timed. Uh, so this two will be timed with n, right? And every two n, you have this access for one, right? Agree, right? And then uh, the outer loop has m and p, right? So that's the total amount of bytes times four, because it's four is 32 bit floating point numbers. Agree? Right, total number of bytes. So, can you count the operational intensity of this algorithm? What's the operational intensity? The amount of work that I want to do per byte, right? So this is the number of operations, and this is the total number of bytes that I will access. So how do you get that? Right, just divide it with, uh, just divide the total number of operations with the total number of bytes, right? So uh, this one is almost ignorable if you, uh, MMP is large enough, right? So it turns out the operational intensity is 0 0.25. So it means that in matrix multiplication, every byte of data uh, would actually generate 0 0.25 floating point operations, right? Agree with that? Is there anything wrong with my math? No, right? I hope not. All right, so, um, so this is just one example regarding how you derive the operational intensity. And in a paper that you read this time, 
it actually tells you a few other algorithms. For example, like the SPMV sparse matrix vector. A lot of you might think, well, for sparse matrix vector, it should be really low. But in fact, because you, you probably have to look into the index or whatever. So turns out that uh, the operational intensity is close to uh, the, 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 the matrix multiplication as well, right? So it's actually 0 0.17 to 0 0.25. It's not that cheap as you can imagine. So that's why uh, a lot of people working on sparse matrix multiplications, and every time when I publish papers, uh, people would generally ask me, like, okay, have you ever thought about matrix, uh, sparse matrix multiplication? And my answer is that, well, my standard answer is that a lot of people are working on the sparse matrix multiplications, and I believe other researchers will make them faster. But to be honest, from my personal per, personal perspective, is that why should I care about this, right? Because it's not even cheaper, right? So, um, like uh, Stanso uh, is like a, a cross uh, operation with your data that actually takes 0 0.33 to 0 0.50 because for each, every number you have to. Uh, like uh, you have to get value from its neighbors. So that's why it's so costly. And for best Fourier transform in a 3D dimension, it's actually like 1.09 to 1.64. So that's a lot more denser, right? So those are the general computational costs for uh, the algorithm. So that's the first part, right? We know how to calculate uh, the operational cost or uh, operational intensity per, for data per byte. Right now, the second question is that uh, so we have been talking. So this is pretty much like okay, how expensive is each byte, right? Or how much money each byte is going to spend on me, or how much effort each byte want from me. Now, the second thing that we want to talk about is that how fast can we supply the data? It's pretty much like how fast how the arrival rate of your customer. Right, so do you have any idea, like, and um, uh, like, how fast is our memory? So, do you have any idea about like how how fast is our memory subsistence? Like, uh, oops, I think this is the answer, right? So, go back to this one, right? Can you tell me how fast? Do you have an idea how fast is your VRAM? How fast is your solid state drive? But how fast? VRAM is like single digit or double digit gigabytes per second. Single digit or double digit gigabyte per second, right? How about your solid state drive? Like one or two gigabytes. Per one or two yeah. gigabyte per second, right? And uh, some of them are actually more advanced versions, so um, maybe, but still single digit gigabyte per second, right? So, okay, now if you know this is the speed, right? And if you know, like for each byte of data, for example, right now, measures multiplication, right? For each byte of data, we are going to generate 0 0.25 uh, for, say, 1 over 4 operation. If you know, okay, so let's say if you have a device that can only supply data at 1 gigabyte per second, how many operations per second do you think that data is going to bring to your system? Given the bandwidth is like one gigabyte per second, given the operational cost is like zero point, uh, operational intensity is 0 0.25, how many operations do you think the device can supply to the system? It's like 250 million bytes. It's like 200, okay, so you have one gigabyte of data being supplied, right? And every byte of data is going to give you uh, a quarter of the operational intensity. So you actually end up with 250 million operations. Agree? Agree? So you can imagine, right? So if today I have a solid state drive, right? And let's say I have a solid state drive that's around like 4 gigabyte per second, right? So if you check the spec, a lot of solid state drives, their reading performance is actually at this level. So if that's the case, how many operations per second can the, the solid state drive support? A billion. a billion, right? So here's the thing, right? So operational intensity, so let's say one over four, right? So that's two to the minus two, right? One over four is two to the minus two, right? Agree with that? Okay, so this is that, right? And 
it can support one billion operations. So if I am having an SSD like here is the blue line, right? And if it's four gigabyte per second, then it's actually here, right? And now if I have an algorithm that has twice the amount of operational intensity and the amount of data that, that I can supply from the SSD remains, then where do you think I should put the dot when I have operational intensity at minus one? Like two to the minus one? Five hundred? If every operation if every byte can now support like zero point five and I'm at four gigabyte per second. Two, right? So it should be like twice of that, right? Like this, right? So how about if I uh, again, twice the amount of the operational intensity at two to the zero, four, right? So it will be at four, right? So what kind of a curve do we envision? It's like a straight line because this is a log, log scale, right? So it will be, yeah, you're right, it's exponential, right? So it's pretty much like this, right? And this is under the assumption of what? the processor, or say you have a boba tea shop with unlimited capacity of serving the cups. So it's pretty much like assuming a system has unlimited capacity, un unlimited uh, serving service rate, right? So you can pretty much see, right? If I assume there is no restriction about how fast can I process my data, your, your, your processing rate is basically your capability of supplying your data. And it's pretty much like several straight lines in a log scale graph, right? So uh, pretty much turns out, um, if you look at the modern system design, uh, the DDR4, uh, a single channel can support like up to 24 gigabyte per second. And uh, I have updated this a little bit because right now uh, we have seen uh, NVMe uh, 4 comes up, and if you use an NVMe 4 as solid state drive, most optimistically, uh, you can actually get like 8 gigabyte per second performance, although uh, I haven't seen one reach that yet, but some of them are really like above 4. So let's say like, okay, most optimistic, we can get 8 gigabyte per second, and in fact, you make it, if you make it a rate, right, you can potentially get 8 gigabyte per second, right? So saying that you have a gigabyte per second performance, right? Then, uh, and other things, right? So for others, like L1 cache, uh, based on the information from Intel, it says that if you have L1, L2 cache, it's around like one terabyte per second, and your L3 is like larger than four gigabyte, uh, 400 gigabyte per second, and let's say it's 400 gigabyte. And uh, your main memory, according to Intel, the best at one, 100 gigabyte, but here's how it comes up with, is that, if you think about your motherboard, typically you have four memory slots, right? And each of them can get like uh, 25. So if you have four different modules, that's how you get like 400, uh, 100, right? And then um, <coughs> like IO devices, uh, uh, IO devices are memory bus, uh, that's pretty much it, right? So those are the uh, latency performance numbers that we got from Intel, right? And that's a very, those are very optimistic. And let's assume this number. and Based on what I mentioned, right? If you draw, if you draw a figure like this, where the horizontal axis is the log scale of your operational intensity, uh, and the vertical axis is the number of operations that we can supply based on different uh, algorithm intensity, you will pretty much see this graph, right? So what it tells you is that okay, the more data that I can supply at each cycle, then uh, my uh, the operations that I can support for the system, uh, I, I, sh I, can, I can provide to the system is actually higher, right? So this is pretty much describing the situation that I open a boba tea shop and I can attract as many customers as I want. And the more customers that I can attract each day, the more cups that I can sell each day. But is that possible? The answer is no, right? As a lot of you mentioned, right? Uh, we may be out of stock. We may be out of labor force, right? So it turns out 
that's not possible, right? But uh, and but um, so um, so here's the thing, right? Um, why in our computer system, who is making that impossible? Like uh, beyond beyond your data, the, the 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 supply of your data, who is actually also creating another constraint about your uh, capability of processing data? Your hardware, but hardware, what kind of hardware? The processor speed, right? So first of all, uh, although very optimistically, we saw the more data we can supply, the faster the computer is. But there is a limitation. And the limitation in the traditional volume architecture is limited by your processor speed. So let's go back to this question. How fast is my processor? So uh, this is the, uh, this is the uh, functional diagram of an Intel, uh, what was that? What kind of a lake? Uh, uh, Elder Lake, right? This is the Elder Lake architecture, right? This is actually uh, the architecture that uh, uh, the demo system is using. And um, here's the thing, right? This is the Elder Lake architecture. But looking at this, can you know like how fast, how many Floating point operations, because as we are talking about the floating point operations for matrix multiplication, do you have an idea like how many floating point operations this processor can support? If I just give you this, you have no idea. So a few things that you can tell, right? So if you look at this uh, figure carefully, right? So first of all, ha, huh, that's why you need to take two hundred three, right? So you see there are a lot of LUs, but if you pay attention, this LUs, they are actually for integers, right? So they are not really contributing to my floating point. And today, for matrix multiplication, we are talking about floating point, right? So yeah, if we have an algorithm that's more about the intensity of integer algorithm, then this matters, and it's actually giving you five per cycle, right? And uh, this is address generation unit, so that's not contributing to your computation. That's more about the data supply, right? So those are not related. And um, so this part, they are all about integers, right? So uh, here is what about floating point. So if you look at the floating point, right? So there are a few ones. So this is the floating point 512. So 512, it means that every cycle, I can process 512 bits of data. And this is to FMA, and if you check the Intel uh, manual carefully, they will tell you each of this has the capability of 256. Um, so here's the interesting thing. So uh, unfortunately, Intel architecture doesn't allow us to activate both. So you can only choose to use FMA 512 or two sets of FMA. So it turns out, although this two looks like these two different units, they seems like they can do things in parallel, but the hardware has a limitation, so we won't be able to do that. So given that, right, uh, but no matter it's two times 256 or one times 512, right, what does that tell you is that every cycle, the Intel processor has the ability to process two vectors of 512 bytes of vector floating point numbers at the same time. Agree with that, right? So how does that, so if every cycle you can produce, you can process uh, 512 uh, bytes, and how many floating point numbers can you process each cycle? If every cycle I can process 512 bytes, pairs of numbers by the size of floating point, and how big is a floating point number? Four bytes, right? So it's 512 divided by four, right? So you got 128, right? So if a processor is clocked at three gigahertz, right? So you can actually, you actually have three billion operations per cycle, right? Per ALU. And if I can have two FMA units perform two times 256 bits of uh, 
vector floating point operations per core is 128 pairs of floating point numbers, right? So that's actually giving you 384 floating point operation, 384 billions of floating point operations per cycle. So that's actually telling you, if I have a CPU, if you can fully utilize the floating point unit on a CPU, 384 gigaflops, gigaflops, right? So that's the capacity or how many cups, how many data that I can process each cycle, right? So <clears throat> here's the thing, right? Although we can supply, it seems like we can supply data uh, as fast as, uh, if uh, we can supply data and uh, it seems like, okay, if I can, sub if, if I can keep supplying data at the rate, the, process, the processing rate should go up with the amount of uh, operational intensity per byte. But in fact, that's not true because there is a capacity of our CPU processing speed, right? So actually at any point, the best performance your system can support for an algorithm is the minimum of either the peak floating point performance or peak memory bandwidth times operational intensity. That's the roofline model, right? So if you have read the paper, you must see this formula, right? And here is how it comes from, right? Okay, so now let's go back to this. If I want to uh, like look at the roofline of the matrix multiplication, here's how it goes, right? So if the data is currently in the SSD, if I have all the data stored in the SSD and SSD uh, is the only place that uh, the data comes from, then essentially your data processing rate is kept at one giga ops per second because eight gigabyte, uh, and that's the data supply, eight gigabyte per second is the data supply rate of your solid state drive. And if your operational intensity, ah, here we, I got it wrong, so it's actually two, right? And uh, here I think it's all four, right? One over four, remember that, right? So. Um, like if you are at DRAM, then you are at uh, something like um, 625, right? And this is more like 14.5 uh, gigaflops, right? But all what we can see is that they are all smaller than the gigaflops that your processor can support, right? So that tells you what? Matrix multiplication if you don't optimize it, right, then it's technically bounded by the performance of your data supply, not your CPU speed, right? So if you don't optimize your code, matrix multiplication code, the algorithm itself is essentially a memory bounded algorithm. Agree with that, right? And that's what the roofline model would tell you, right? So, um, and another thing that you can check, right, is that, okay, so that's, the roofline model is called roofline because you can actually see a roof. We say, well, if we can, uh, if we keep, uh, keep the same data supply rate and uh, we run, um, we, we, in a system, we just in, increase the, uh, we just run uh, with, pro, uh, with uh, algorithms with different operational intensity, it seems like the higher the intensity of the data, the higher performance are of, of our system is, right? But with that cap from the processor, you will figure out that, um, turns out, there is a cap of your system performance. That's actually your CPU uh, peak performance, right? So everything above the peak CPU performance is impossible, right? Even though I can supply data at the peak rate and the operational intensity is this high, but because your processor is just this fast, so it's almost impossible to reach the performance beyond that, right? So this is, so if you look at this, right, this whole line is like a roof, right? This is why it's called roof line model. So right now, let's, let's forget about this part, right? That's, Return off this part and make the graph clear. 
that's actually the roof line model bigger looks like right that's a roof line model and like this purple line is telling you if I can optimize my program in a way where all the data that the algorithm needs to digest is actually in the L1 and L2 before the algorithm needs the data. So that's pretty much meaning that if you have a cache optimized code where your capacity fits in the L1, L2, for example, tiling algorithm, right? Then if you have a matrix multiplication algorithm with operational intensity at, uh, uh, Sorry, at okay at uh, like uh, one one uh, zero point twenty five, right? You are here, right? Still bounded by cache performance, but that's the maximum floating point operations that you can achieve with the processor you have in a system, right? If you have cache optimized code. However, if you don't optimize your code and it turns out you are <laughs> Uh, just relying on the solid state drive to give you the source data, and that's the maximum amount of performance you can get. And today, if I have like FFT, right, which takes uh, one operations per byte, which is two to the zero, right, then you can see uh, if you have cache optimized code, it's bounded by your CPU performance, right? So you can pretty much say, based on the roof line, I can draw some kind of lines saying that if today I have a, I have program uh, that doesn't cannot really fit into my cache and I have no way to make it optimized with cache, right? The sweet spot of my system design is actually for operational per byte, at operations per byte or operational intensity at two to the four. So beyond this is actually CPU bounded. And below this is going to be VRAM bandwidth bounded. Right? So here's the thing, how can you tell this algorithm is going to be bottleneck throttled by uh, the memory or the CPU performance? Count the operational intensity. Right? And if it's like for this system, if it's beyond two to the four, which is like 16 operations per byte, then you can finally code this is computational intensive, right? But other than that, everything is pretty much bounded by your memory speed in a way that if you can increase your memory speed, then your algorithm will be faster. And it doesn't matter how fast your processor, in, it doesn't make sense to give you if you want better processor. Right? Agree with that? So see, from this example, you can pretty much see why we need a roofline model. Right? It's another way for letting you know if I'm designing a system or if I'm running an algorithm, what's the fundamental root cause of my slowness? Right? Like if my operational intensity is this low, that's pretty much because your data supply cannot be faster. And increasing the data supply or making your data structure more efficient to access or optimize the cache performance is the way to go. However, if the algorithm itself is very operational intensive, then the data supply probably doesn't matter that much. Right? So, um, and again, in a system design, we always want our system to be at right at this corner, right? Because if you are right at this corner, turning point, it's actually telling you I'm not wasting any memory bandwidth and I'm not wasting any of my uh, computational resource, right? So that's the sweet spot for every system design would like to see. And how do you know if you are at a sweet spot or not? Look at the roof line model, right? <clears throat> and again, if I can optimize my system in a way that uh, I can optimize my code for, uh, like I think this line is a little bit off. I'm actually drawing the case for L1, L2. If I have L1, L2 optimized code, you can, uh, you can actually shift it the computation bound uh, and memory bound threshold to the left, which means that, okay, as long as my operational intensity is uh, greater than 0 0.5, then it's going to be a computation bound problem, right? So that's why uh, cache 
tiling algorithm or cache friendly algorithm becomes so uh, so uh, so useful because it's actually making your performance better without changing your hardware, right? And it allow you to better utilize your CPU resource. Okay, so and if we place uh, our algorithm in this, right, you can still see like matrix multiplications is still a memory bounded problem, and 3D FFT is right around the corner in a way that if you have cache optimized code, it's right around the corner of uh, the modern CPU system, right? So uh, a lot of you who are familiar with machine learning or you are familiar with, uh, uh, yeah, mostly machine learning, you will notice that Recently, we have seen increasing uh, interest in alternative floating point data types like uh, grand float, floating point 16. Or it, like this is the this is the this is the manual from Intel. So even the Intel's uh, AMX extension, they are supporting deep, deep float 16, which is which is a 16 bit floating point number. So I just want you to recap what you learned from. Um, the roof line model and telling me how does have precision floating point change the roof line and the system design? We can take the cookies. Yeah, and also coffee. The last time we have a lot of that left over, and nobody wants to drink coffee anymore. So, because we have our own like espresso machine in house, so people like that. <laughs> All right. So, what do you guys think about the half precision floating point would change the roof line? So how the half precision would change the mathematics of roofline model? You can perform double the operations. You can perform double the operations of what? 
in what way if I'm having the same floating point operation supported by my system. <clears throat> We can, okay, so if I have a system, right, and if I cannot change my floating point flops, right, because the number of floating point operations that I can support per cycle is pretty much the same, right? So we can change what? We can change, we can support, we can basically supply more numbers per cycles, mm -hmm. right? But let's put this in the roof line model, right? How, in the roof line model, we, are, we care about two things. Right, one is the flops per processor, and the other thing is what? Operational intensity, operation per byte, right? So which part would have precision change? Operation per byte, right? Because if you are having a floating point number, then it's actually four bytes per operation. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, one operation for every four bytes, right? But right now, you are actually making the operation per byte to become two bytes, one up, right? So you are making your code more operational intense. What does that mean? <clears throat> if your code is, has higher operational intensity, what does that imply? It becomes more memory bound? Computation bound, right? So again, right, originally, if you have 32-bit measures multiplication, you are here. But right now, if you are at 16-bit uh, measures multiplications, given the same hardware without additional support, right, you are actually moving making your code more operation, uh, uh, operational intense, right? And then what that gives you is that, <clears throat> what it implies is that I'm using the memory bandwidth more efficiently, I'm supplying more data at the same time, so it makes the problem to be less memory bounded and become more reliant on the computational uh, capability of your system. And remember what we said about the measures multiplication. We were originally at memory bound. But look at this, right? If I have <clears throat> have precision, I'm actually making this problem more computation bound. Right? And look at this graph. You we are actually closer to the sweet spot of our system design if we use half precision hardware, uh, half precision numbers. Right? So that's why uh, people are so fascinated about the idea of reduced precision just because uh, it makes um, the roofline model to be more computation bound than less memory dependent, right? So that's why uh, when we talk about machine learning and when we talk about measures modifications, a lot of people were talking about like reduced precision. Not because it gives you better result, it just means that we can get our result faster, right? Okay, so now, <clears throat> Uh, another question is that, based on the roofline model and uh, what you learned so far, how do you know if we want to go for improved processor or alternative architectures? So we were talking about, right, remember in the very beginning we were talking about, should we continue with our computational-centric model or data-centric model, right, more data supply-based model, right? If you have the roofline model, how does that help you to design?
What is better to do like memory pack versus like copy pack? Like, like, Say again. What is it better to do like memory pack instead of like copy pack? Well. Or like vice versa. So you well remember what I said about the sweet spot, right? Uh -huh. We should write at the corner of the roof line, which means that it's not even oh, yeah. it's, it's neater. Not it's not it's neater, it's right? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> That's actually the sweet spot that we are looking for. Okay, okay. Well, you should well you should move your like. You should move it closer there, right? You should, yeah. <clears throat> well, so if you are on a memory bump, right, it means that you are always wasting some of your computational capacity, right? If you are on the right hand side, then it means that I'm always wasting my memory capacity, so memory bandwidth. Right, so that's why we want to be on the sweet spot, right? <clears throat> okay, so any thoughts? How do you decide you want to pursue for better processor or there's no way we can make the algorithm better with better processor and we should go for alternative architecture. How do you decide that? Where you lie on the roofline model, right? So here's the thing. If I have an algorithm that was really, really low operational intensity, then I should go for um, some kind of alternative architecture because it means that the main problem is not computation at all. It's more about uh, the data supply. And uh, it's better to stay my computation closer to the data or I just don't need to give the system good processor, right? That's the answer. However, if my algorithm is pretty uh, computational, operational intense, it turns that better processor still help. So I have a question for you. Do you and so this is the zone for in-story processor, right? And uh, if you go beyond that, right, you should try to look for better processors because it means that even though I optimize my code with cache-friendly algorithm, there's no better way that I can make my algorithm better. So I should look for better processor, right? So that's the another thing that roofline model can tell you. So summary of the roofline model, it defines the best performance we can achieve under a certain architecture and it tells us like how good we are in optimizing our code. And again, uh, don't ask your staff to sell more cups if you don't give them more labor force because that's impossible. Another thing, uh, the same thing for your system. If your processor is just this fast, even though you supply it with more data, there's no way we can process it. So roofline models also define the ceiling of your performance, right? So that's why we care about the roofline model. And roofline model is also a good thing to help you to identify if your problem is memory bound or compute bound. And if it's memory bounded, a few things that you can think of are we, have we efficiently used the cache? Have we reduced the data volume, right? And like uh, if you use half precision, at least you can reduce the data volume. And, uh, uh, if you use tau algorithm, tauling algorithm, you can make your cache use more efficient, right? And compute bound, can I make the algorithm more efficient? For example, reduce the operation per bound, uh, per byte, right? Or can I use more or other processing unit? For example, can I use uh, other processing unit like GPUs or whatever, right? So, okay, so what kind of applications do you care about nowadays? Machine learning. learning, okay, awesome, right? So uh, if you check the second paper that we learned from, uh, we, we read, uh, we read uh, before the lecture, it's actually the TPU paper, right? So uh, if you are careful enough, you should be able to find this table. So this table tells you that at uh, 20, I think it's around 2016, right? Uh, 
like seven years ago, these are the nets that people care about, like MLP01, LSTM, and CNN, right? So for this, um, they also tell you this like uh, ops per byte, right? So it's the operational intensity of uh, this machine learning algorithm. And if you look at that, 200, 168, uh, 64, 96, 2,088, uh, two, well, two, 288, uh, 88, or one, uh, one, uh, 1,750, right? So that's way more than the metrics multiplication, which is 0 0.25, right? So here the same, because I draw the figure in uh, log two scale. So I also translated this operational intensity into log scale. So you can see like, okay, with LSTM, which is already the lowest here, it's more than two to the six, right? Uh, 64, right? Two to the six uh, operations per byte, right? Every byte of data is going to trigger two to the six operations at least in this machine learning algorithms. And with CNN, it's going to be two to the 12, right? So if you place that in our roofline model, right? This is L LSTM, obviously CPU bounded, right? If it's two to the 12, it's still CPU bounded, right? So what does that tell you? If I want to build a system that's efficient for machine learning, should I increase the memory bandwidth? Doesn't help. Should I, so what should I do? I need better processing unit, right? So it turns out, uh, well, some of you would think about like, oh, can we continue scaling the CPU, right? But as many of you know, over the past eight years, we only get like less than three times speed up, right? So, uh, and the reason if you take 203, you know because of the power issue. So there's no way we can make the processor faster, right? Because of the power issue. So turns out we have to seek for alternative architecture. So the first alternative computing resource that we are relying on is actually the, C, the GPU, graph processing unit, right? And this is the GPU architecture. Don't feel uh, offended about it. And, and next week, you are going to read a paper about the GPU architecture, so I won't talk too much detail here. But GPU architecture is basically a set of vector processors. And uh, inside an SM, you have a lot of parallel uh, processing units. So you can imagine um, uh, it's, a, it's a unit with uh, more floating point operations per seconds available. So with that, how do you think the GPU is going to reshape the roof line model? OK, talk to your friends and run. It's, it will change, I know, right? How, what's, the, what's the new shape of the roof line? Yeah. 
So, Albert, what do you think? Uh, um, I think it should raise the roof. It raised the roof, right? How many of you agree with that? Okay, yeah, here's the thing, right? So, um, originally our roof is just at this place, right? But with GPU, and if you can optimize your codes for their GDDR6, which is their high bandwidth memory, you can pretty much raise your roof line here, right? So for LSTM, which has two to the six, right? It's actually um, still going to be bounded by the GPU performance. However, the maximum floating point operations is actually uh, at the GPU performance, right? And, uh, and the GPU flux is actually higher. Right? So you are actually going to achieve more flux, right? But again, right, if you look at this one, for LSTM, even I have GPU optimized code. Is this still, is this still a computational bound problem? Yes, right, because your performance is still computational bound, right? And CNN is still computational bound, right? And as companies who trans or run machine learning, and, but another implication that you can get is that, well, so we were talking about near data processing. And um, why in the past people don't talk about near data processing? Because there is not that much room for near data processing. But right now, because the computational speed is so much, so this part of uh, near data processing becomes, make, makes more sense, right? So that's something that you can tell from the roof line, right? So otherwise in the past, if uh, if everything is memory bounded and, oh well, uh, well, if everything is quickly like CPU bounded, then computation bounded, it's going to make more sense to make your computation more faster, right? So that's the implication of GPU. However, right, okay, why don't we just make GPU faster? Like, okay, if right now our performance is bottleneck at the GPU, why can't we just make faster Faster, faster GPU. Power, right? So power energy, right? So if you look at the spec of NVIDIA GPUs, right now the H100 takes 700 watts, right? Per card, right? And A100 is 400 watts, right? So that's actually, and what's the next generation? 1400 watts, right? Are you going to make it happen? The answer is probably not. So that's why uh, Google, they start to look for alternative architectures like Tensor Processing Unit, which is their hardware accelerator. And the hardware accelerator, uh, like this is the first generation of Tensor Processing Unit looks like. And uh, if you look at the hardware design, right, it's essentially an accelerator that's optimized for uh, the most uh, important uh, uh, part of the compute kernels in machine learning algorithm is actually matrix multiplication, right? So compare against the data, uh, so if you remember what I talked about, uh, the matrix multiplication, well, uh, the GPU is ve basically a, a vector processors. So if you want to perform matrix multiplication, every time you have to take two vectors and multiply them, uh, count, count the inner product. Right, so uh, for example, like this example, I have three by three uh, matrix, uh, matrix, matrices that I want to multiply, right? And as I said, every time you take uh, one row column, a uh, row vector and one column vector and just generate a dot product. And uh, if your result is also in a three by three matrix, then you need to get like a three by three, which is nine inner product available, right? So if today, uh, I have three by three matrices and I have nine processing elements in my system, like nine ALUs in my system. It turns out that, well, even though I have vector processors, right, if you look at the processing model, only in a very first cycle, I'm able to perform uh, pairwise multiplication using this, uh, fully utilize this nine ALUs. And the second part, I have to do the accumulation. Right, but even though I try to optimize my code to do binary 
uh, like binary reduction tree accumulation, it still take me two more cycles to accumulate uh, this uh, vector numbers, right? So it turns out uh, then if you see how it works, it turns out that for n square matrices, the conventional vector processor would take n log n operations uh, to finish a vector uh, a matrix oper a matrix multiplication. So, and during this process, you see a lot of waste in your vector processors, right? So that's not very efficient, right? And the inefficiency is where we are wasting power, wasting energy. So turns out. Uh, in AI ML accelerators, when we implement this matrix multiplier, uh, there is another sauce, another kind of architecture called systolic array. And the idea of systolic array is that here I still have a total of nine LUs, but in fact, when I do this, there are two types of operations that I'm performing. So through this direction or this direction, I'm doing accumulation, and in this intersection, I'm doing multiplication. So what will happen is that in the very beginning, although it seems like I'm underutilized on my hardware resource, but every wave I am producing a multiplication result and pass it as the input of the next one, and then uh, gradually you will figure out that the systolic array can uh, gradually accumulate the values, and then turns out that uh, I can fully utilize this LUs, and if you go through this process uh, carefully, you will figure out it's a more efficient architecture, which takes three uh, n minus two steps to accomplish a matrix multiplication, which is a lot faster, a lot more efficient than uh, the conventional vector processors. So TPU, when they implement their matrix multiply unit, they are based they are based on this kind of philosophy in designing their hardware to make it more efficient in using the hardware. So total, so it turns out that um, uh, you, you waste fewer power when you are doing matrix multiplication. And the, the number of cycles you need to perform matrix multiplication is also fewer. So it turns out that, right, uh, it's a lot faster, right? Because reduce the number, the amount of operations that you need. And the other thing is uh, conventionally, when you control this vector processor, you need uh, operations on every pairs of vector, but for uh, TPUs, one instruction will perform all the matrix multiplications, right? So you can actually uh, reduce the instruction count, and also power-wise, because your logic becomes simpler and more efficient, so your power consumption is lower, and if it's faster, power consumption is lower, it tells you that energy is better, right? So that's why TPU uh, or this kind of hardware accelerators become a, an idea that's fascinated to the companies. So uh, again, remember what we talk about, right? Any kind of accelerator or different kind of uh, better uh, processing unit would lift the ceiling of your roof line. So it turns out if you have TPU, then your roof line would be like this, right? So pretty much everything is becoming memory bounded if you have TPU. Right, so it turns out like LSTM at the end it become memory bounded. On CNN it also become memory bounded if you have TPU, right? So, um, so um, if you look at that, right, if everything is memory bounded, uh, then it's not too difficult to understand why in the GPU is uh, TPU itself it needs a very wide uh, memory bus between the matrix multiply unit and its systolic array cache because. Uh, the, the 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 only reason that would make you underutilize your matrix unit is your data supply. So that's why they want a very very giant uh, memory bus inside their unit to avoid the data supply becoming the bottleneck of their matrix multiplication unit. Okay, so that's uh, the basic idea about TPUs, and we can actually talk more about uh, the TPU architecture in the next lecture and. Uh, in the next lecture, we, uh, if you read the paper, we are going to also talk about the recent advances in uh, the GPU architecture as well and some applications of it. So uh, before you leave the classroom, I think uh, a few things that I want to mention. First of all, don't forget to form your group and discuss the project ideas and 
Um, if you haven't been in our Google space and if you just recently uh, added to our class, let me know uh, because that's the place. So this class, we are not going to use Canvas. I hate that system. And uh, a lot of you hate that too, right? So, uh, and, but you know, if you want to check Canvas email, you will be in the Gmail anyway. And so let's use Google space, right? And Google space, if you know how to use it, we have threads, we have tasks, right? Which reminds you what's going on. So it's probably not a bad idea. And another thing which is bad or good is that every time when somebody responds to it, it will give me a notification. So to be honest, I won't miss anything, right? But if you, uh, if you do things on e-learn, send me an email, I probably will miss it too. So that's probably not a, that's a pretty good um, platform for us to communicate with each other. And uh, some of you might be asking, well, it's such a good stuff, why don't I use it for uh, like bigger class? Because for bigger class, I really don't want to get that many notifications, right? But for this class, I think it's okay to do that. Okay, so first of all, the most important thing is form your group, discuss the pro potential project ideas, right? And um, then uh, I will send you guys an announcement on the Google Space because I will go into set up a few appointment slots. So once you form your group, you have some ideas, uh, book an appointment with me, and I will discuss with your project. All right? Other than that, enjoy the rest of your week. I will see you next week. Uh, yes, the same form. Yeah, just keep using the same form.